and and you know it used to be in the olden days I could just you could you could do like you just did Skype me okay and then I take your phone call from Skype and I bridge it over on the my uh, phone and then all of us are talking like a big party line all right well they, that's ixnay on the party line pay they don't allow you to do that no more now <laughs> now you either have to telephone them with a regular telephone or a cell phone <clears throat> or uh, somehow you've got a I don't I don't understand what the restrictions may be but I was told by another brother who's a heavy user of the of this system that if you just click that little Skype button <clears throat> on the on the live show, it'll Skype you in directly to the show. But evidently that didn't work either, so we had to fall back to the phone. But we're so glad to have you here. God bless you. What an exciting book and what an exciting testimony. I can't wait for you to share with uh, the listeners the whole story. Well, thank you for having me on your show. Um I I could just start anywhere if you just if you have a particular thing you want me to talk about or Yeah, well, the whole thing. I I want to hear the whole story. I this is I think this is one of the most if not the single most important type of a testimony that people, uh, especially Christians, need to know today. We need to know who our enemy is, what our enemy is doing to us, and what we're up against so that we can appropriately uh, apportion our power uh, through Christ Jesus against this enemy. And, And if you don't know the wiles of the devil... How do you react to it? I mean, um, I, you know, I wrote down some uh, notes like the fall. What happened in the fall of 1995 when you said in your book, All Hell Broke Loose? What what opened this whole Pandora's box? Okay, well, I'll, I'll give a brief background. Um, I had been fighting depression for years. It started probably when I was about 18 uh, when I w- went to work at Fort Leonard Wood, and it just increasingly got worse. And even though I, when I married my husband, who was a minister, I thought, well, that would help. Um, but it, it just kept getting worse and worse. And so finally, um, I just cried out to God in December of, I guess that would have been 93, and asked him uh, to please help my family because it's hard to live in a house with a depressed woman. And, and of course, as I'll explain later, that was the tip of the iceberg, but um, so I cried out to God, and about 20 days later, it was in January of 94, I woke up, and the depression was gone, completely gone. And I, the only way I could describe it is probably if someone just first gets saved and that excitement and that hunger for the Word. And I, I had that for about eight months, and it was just glorious. I mean, I, I was trying to hear God's voice. I finally had broke through. I thought I was hearing His voice. And then in August of that same year, the depression came back worse. And so I had to uh, to just finally cry out to God again and say, how did this happen? How do you get delivered and then you get back in that shape again? And so um, I would went outside on a cold night and was praying and asking God, you know, how did I, I regress to this, Lord? And I, I heard him say that I had demonic oppression. And my mind was fighting what I was hearing because I'd been taught that a, a Christian couldn't have a demon or have oppression. And so I just I pressed in again, and I prayed harder, and I heard the same thing. And, and uh, what God told me to do is he said, now you bind them, um, and then I'll tell you how to get rid of them. And so I said, well, I bind you in the name of Jesus. And the, the, when I said that, I felt like I got hit in the back of the head with a hammer. <laughs> and so I thought, well, there's something to this. So I went in, and I had my husband pray. And then that started a long process of me just uh, learning what had happened to me and what was going on. And one of the key things that happened uh, that that uh, let me know um, some of the things that went on in my life is I I was praying for somebody else that I was close to, and uh, during this time I started to pray for them and it was just like I had the most demonic attack, and it was it was like voices just reminded me of everything that person had ever said that was hurtful, everything they'd done to try to stop me from praying. So I finally just got so agitated by that and I said, well I'll tell you what I'm not not only am I going to pray this person through. But if they're supposed to be in the ministry, I'll hold their coat. And the minute I said that, it just broke that attack. And then immediately I heard the Lord say that if you and this other person ever wanted to get free, you have to look at something. And I was so gripped by fear, and I didn't know why, but I thought, well, if that's the only way I can get free, then I'll look at anything. You know, and I was I was praying, and, and I just saw, um, I had just a, a vision, and I saw this person that I was praying for uh, laying on a slab, I saw people in robes. 
I saw my great grandmother and my great aunt standing there. That was the end of it. So I thought, oh my goodness! I thought, how could something like this have happened? And then I heard God tell me. He said, now I want you to go pray for that person. And He said, don't you tell them what you saw. Don't mention anything about what you saw. They'll confirm it to you. And so I kept thinking, surely I'm not hearing right. Surely this is wrong. So I prayed with my husband. We bound up the enemy that he couldn't show me anything that was false. Uh, we did a long prayer session, and then I, I had asked this person if I could come and pray, and they said, sure. So I went and I said the prayers just like God told me to. And they turned and they grabbed me, and they said, Mary, uh, this woman was a witch, and she used me in a ritual. And she started describing her little Easter dress she had on. And so I was so stunned and shocked at this. You know, I'm kind of just in a, um, a haze at the moment because it was so hard to believe that it was actually true. So then she went and, and brought out some uh, handkerchiefs that this woman had given her and wrapped something up at money, I think she said. And so I said, well, I think we better get rid of these. And so she had a, a wood furnace. And so I went and I threw those handkerchiefs in the wood furnace and um, they wouldn't burn. There was a blazing fire going, and they wouldn't catch on fire. And so I waited, and I went, and I finally said, I plead the blood of Jesus over you, and they burst into flames. Wow. So I was still in a almost a state of shock, and uh, I prayed a, a prayer, and then I, I went home, and I was talking to my husband. I said, do you think this could possibly have happened? And um, so anyway, I went and talked to um, someone that said that my great-grandmother was a witch. And so I went to talk to my father the next day because that was his grandfather. And you know the word says you got to have out of two or three witnesses. <laughs> and so um, I went to talk to my father, and I honestly thought when I asked him this question, I thought, well, he's probably going to say, oh, that's the silliest thing I ever heard. No, there's nothing like that. So I went in and I said, I said, Dad, uh, someone said that, that uh, your grandma was a, a witch. I said, do you remember anything that would make you think that was true? And he burst into tears and said, maybe I don't want to remember. And Aww. he was just sobbing and going and i thought oh my goodness there's some truth to this there's some and so he was so distraught and he and he got extremely worried and he said he said now don't you tell anybody this if you tell anybody this he said they'll they'll throw you in fulton which is a city in missouri that houses a mental institution and he was just so frantic about that and so uh i went and prayed with my husband again and i said do you think there's any way this could be true and, and he said well he said we're going to pray and that that god will show us truth um, and so the the amazing thing is, is once I heard that, I thought, okay, if I've got witchcraft in my background, I'm going to ask God to forgive those sins. I'm going to plead the blood of Jesus. And, and from that point on, my depression never came back. Um, and, of course, then as time went on, I can go now to the point you said in 1995, we'd opened up a storefront church. Uh, and things were going forward for me. I was I was praying through any situation. I felt like I was making headway in the kingdom of God, and, and things were going well. And uh, we opened up a storefront church, and uh, there was another ministry that had asked me to pray with someone that they, they thought might have had ritual abuse. Um, and so I, I'd begin, begun to pray with them. And so I, I was in the process of that. At the same time, I had... Um, felt like the Lord wanted me to go out uh, on the porch and pray one night. And when I was out there, um, he said that there were people that lived in my area that were getting ready to defile the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, and I didn't, I mean, I had read that term in the Bible, but I couldn't have told you where it was or even understood what it meant, actually. And the minute I thought that, I heard him say, look in Leviticus 23, so I ran inside, and I got my Bible, and I couldn't believe it. I opened it up, and there it was. <laughs> and so it said that it was the seventh month, the 15th day, and I didn't know how to figure out how that was. So I asked my husband. He said, we need a Jewish calendar, and come to find out it was that very next weekend. And so um, I prayed all week, and God had told me to pray that, you know, those that were uh, Satan's followers wouldn't get anything done, and I, I went ahead and prayed. Well, then that, that weekend came, and we had several... Uh, odd things that happened we were having our church services on sunday morning at that time and we got up and there was blood all over the back patio and so i thought well maybe that could be a you know a wounded animal walk by well then we went to church and i just had this feeling in in my stomach that something was wrong so when we got out of church uh we stopped by the store again because second time that day on the way home to pick up things because i'd invited people to come and pray with me considering what that weekend was 
So when I got to the store, uh, my husband went in, and I stayed out in our van with our two girls and then a couple of kids from the church. And so these vehicles pulled up with people that I've known. I mean, this was a small town. You know everyone. And I just kept feeling like something's really wrong. And so this woman started walking toward the van, and I knew her. I'd went to high school with her. And she jerked open my husband's uh, door on the other side, and she said, where are you going? And I said, you know where I'm going. And she manifested a demon and stuck her tongue out, and her hands looked like they were claws, and she started crawling across my husband's seat toward me. So I took my seatbelt off, and I thought, um, well, you know, I'm not going to let her hurt my kids. And as a matter of fact, it wasn't godly thoughts. I was thinking, you know, what, how am I going to stop her, and what am I going to do, you know, to... And I thought, well, I'll just we'll roll around this parking lot, but she's not going to touch my kids is what was going through my mind. And then I I just started praying inside, and I said I said her name, and I said, I love you, but stop what you're doing or you'll be destroyed. And when I said that, it's just like she melted. Just all the power left her, and she crawled back out, and then she turned her back to me and said, uh, you mean turn like this? And then she walked off speaking in some some other language. And from that point on, it was just one thing after another. We had people going by our house cursing us. They did these things called walk-by curses, I guess. I don't know what you'd call them, but they would, when we were having services, they'd go by. And it was it was just a nonstop thing for a long time. <laughs> wow. Uh, you must have been absolutely freaking out. I mean, uh, one of the things now, now, you, now I, I'm not an expert. I just read read about stuff like this, and, you know, so I don't really know um, firsthand and certainly when you hear testimonies of people who have been intimately, you know, directly firsthand involved in these types of uh uh confrontations, uh you tend to learn a lot because as you know, <clears throat> we get told all kinds of stuff and there's all kinds of sacred cows in the churches, but until you're, you know, there yourself, you don't really uh know all the things that can potentially happen. And what I've learned, or at least think I might have learned, is that it seems like when you're dealing with a demon in, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a demon, when it's between you and a demon, you and a demon directly, uh, e.g., you're, you're on your knees, you're at spiritual warfare, you are binding and casting out the demons of death that are, you know, trying to block your prayers or whatever the case may be, uh, you know, that, that, that pleading blood of Jesus and going directly against the, the forces of darkness, binding and casting, uh, why uh, it tends to be pretty straightforward and relatively effective, uh, very effective. But um, what it seems to – tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know, but I've gotten the impression that it appears that when the witch, when these human beings – are acting on behalf of these powerful walk-in demons uh, that the whole spiritual warfare dynamic takes on a whole other dimension of challenge whereby you're no longer it's no longer between you and the demon directly but it's more or less between you and that and the ter- and the determination of the individual and the multiple the multitude of demons that they're manifesting uh, and powers of those demons against you over an extended period of time is that true well it was it was definitely a learning experience for me and what I found as I continued on this path and I kept running, you know, these people would come and say things. And uh, what I found is that I had to look past that person to see what was what I was really fighting. You know, the word says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And and even though you, you feel a frontal attack and you think you have to have physical, um, I wasn't going to let anybody touch my kids. Now, if it's just me, you know, if they lay, laid hands on me, that that's one thing. But, I mean, we're required to protect our children. So that first encounter was probably a little bit different because it was such a shock to me. Um, I was thankful that God got a hold of me and I was able to to speak to her, too, because you're dealing with a bound individual and you're dealing with strong demon um, manifestations at the same time. So you're absolutely right. It was it was quite the ordeal. And what I guess what was the most confusing thing for me um, was... It, it wouldn't have been such a confusing thing if I thought, okay, I'm just in this small town and we have a high number of occult people. But what was so confusing was it was like a switch would be thrown at different times and people that I'd known my whole life would switch to um, 
different people. It was like there were evil twins or something. And all of a sudden, John, they would say um, the craziest things. And, you know, I wrote it in my book, like how they'd say, like, follow the yellow brick road. We're the cog in the center of the wheel. Uh, I had somebody quoting uh, Edgar, Allan Poe, Edgar Allan Poe to me and just out of the blue make, made no sense. It sounded like a bunch of mental patients talking to me. And that was what was the most confusing thing. If I thought I'd just been dealing alone with, you know, just people that were out and out in the occult, but what was so confusing and, and took me and my husband a long time to understand what was going on was was that manifestation at the same time. Yeah, because you, cause sometimes you were talking to them and other times you were talking directly to the demon. Well, in, in this situation, I believe um, this is, is speculation on my part um, based on what I have remembered and based on what my husband's research. And the first thing that I, I tell everyone is that I, I started having some memories come up uh, after God had told me during one prayer session that I needed to bind gatekeepers and watchers. I didn't even know what that was, but I just followed what God told me to do. And once I bound that, it was like I, I started having uh, snippets of memory that would come up because I had a lot of periods in my life that I couldn't remember. And um, you just think, well, how, how did you not know something was wrong? It's, it's When something happens to you when you're a child and you're traumatized, those things get blocked. And so your mind just learns to work to where you can function. And part of that function involves you block that trauma, and then you your mind just kind of covers it up. You just go on and you just learn how to function with that. And I had to come to grips with the fact that I had had trauma and that a lot of those people in that town had had trauma. And I believe what we were dealing with, based on our research, um, was that, that our town was an experimental place. And it was connected to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, uh, where I believe there were experiments starting with Operation Paperclip, that they, they started using things connected with Project Monarch. And that was that was what I was seeing, was that somehow the people had, um, I hate to the only way I know how to describe it is different personalities, but in, in my mind it's easier to say fragmented, to where when you're traumatized, your mind so that you can survive blocks that through a process of brain chemical release and so on. Um, and I, I believe that's what we were dealing with there. And I, I've told everyone this. I have memories of things that happened, but I don't base anything on that because I know that there's programming and I know that there were things done to us as children and so I don't base it on just my memories, although my memories, they seem to lend credibility to the research my husband was finding. But I based it on what was going on right in front of my eyes. I based it on the things everybody was saying and the crazy things I saw. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, satanic ritual abuse, uh, dissociative, dissociative uh, di- identity disorder, uh, you know, SRADID uh, is uh, a tactic. Um, anybody who does any deep dive, I mean, I'm not talking about superficial research, folks. I'm talking about the real kind of research, the kind of research that after you do it, you wonder if you should have even done it because what you <laughs> right. discover is so horrible that it's the kind of thing that once it's in your mind you wish you, you had never even known that it was possible they could do something like that and um and yeah the the so are, are you under the impression uh that um that uh that 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 fort was doing that kind of you know they had illuminati high end Illum- because this is this is a very very common practice uh that the illuminati trainers that are brought up uh within the family uh, for lack of a better term we'll just call them the family, e.g. the bloodlines that raise their uh-huh. kids and raise up babies and use them for sacrifices and stuff like that, the family. So you you believe part of the family operation was actually there at that fort and that they were uh, doing, uh, they had what, 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 what you would call Illuminati training operations there? Well, the, one of the things that caused me to doubt my own memory so much is, is of all the research that my husband was able to to look at, and he would tell me, you know, the research as he was uncovering it, um, we, we couldn't find anything on Fort Leonard Wood. We found other military bases and other places, but we could find nothing on Fort Leonard Wood. And so in those initial stages, I just thought, you know, actually what I thought I can tell you this because Christians will surely understand this part. I was so afraid that I had come out of a depression, and so Satan was going to do the next tactic possible, which would be to get me off on some wild tangent 
to where that I would be ineffective in my Christian walk that way <laughs> because it was so bizarre to me uh, what my husband was researching. And uh, now when, you know, if somebody reads my book and they see how at the at the very end of my book I try to connect my actual memories that I've had my whole life with these new memories that were coming up, you can tell something was wrong. You know, I put in there about where I had a dentist, my first trip to a dentist, he drilled my whole tooth out with no painkillers. I've known that my whole life. I kept that memory. I even told my husband when we first got married, and he he just couldn't believe a dentist would do that. But what was so shocking to me was when I reevaluated it, and I thought, how in the world would a child sit there and go through that pain? I mean, there's something terribly wrong when a child would sit there, and the dentist says, if you feel pain, hold your hand up. I hold my hand up. He doesn't stop, and I don't kick him. You know, if my kids had had anybody try to inflict pain on them like that, well, they would have been all over that. You know, they'd have been flailing and knocking the guy over. And, and so I had to look back on those situations in my life and think, well, of course something was wrong. Of course something happened to me. But but your mind just disregards it. Your mind, so what I call it, the, pardon? Well, 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 well yeah, so let, me, so let me just ask you. I mean, you know, um, do you remember enough to have any idea how you got, you know, Sucked uh, well, into I the believe, whole deal. I mean, how did they get a hold of you? I mean, a lot of I them. I do believe. You know, okay. I believe that that my parents were victims too. Um, now I don't there know. There you go. As, okay. As far as my as my mom's side, uh, I just know that I do believe that that this is speculation on my part because I don't have right. proof of this part. This is just me trying to make sense of it all. Right. Uh, my father had joined the army when he was uh, young. Now, I don't have the dates of that. This was before I was born uh, because um, this is just stories that I'm remembering they told me all through my life. He joined the Army. Something happened, and he had bleeding ulcers. And so he had to get a medical discharge. And there was some doctor that that flew in from Texas that was a specialist that had to operate on him. They took out like three-fourths of his stomach, something like that. And my mom had always told me that this was like a – very serious thing and that they would have to like let one drop of blood go in him at a time because so his heart would pick it up i mean he was on the brink of death i guess and so my mom always said you know that all mentioned all this time in the hospital so we were very poor and so i asked her one time after i was grown i said well mom who who paid those hospital bills and she said well i guess they just wrote them off and so my speculation is uh maybe the the great grandma and my great may have traded um, something that somebody did with us to pay those hospital bills off. Now, I'm not saying that that uh, my family would have done that um, as, a, as a bad thing that they didn't care about us. They did. My, I have memories that my mom and dad took the best care of me that they could have in that situation. But I believe that there's a, a chance that because I've been able to connect a doctor, the only way I can connect Freemasons to, to what happened to my dad was the doctor's wife, and I was able to get that off her, of her obituary. So I don't know if this was like a Freemason reconnection that they paid the bills, that yoked them into us, and then they took us kids and did something. I mean, that's what I'm assuming. And then by my dad's reaction, you know, it, it was real hard to get anything out of my mom and dad after that initial cried and said we didn't want to I don't know that my dad wasn't a victim and I don't know that we all didn't go you know if they weren't we weren't taken to rituals I have memories of that uh, but I don't have any confirm it other than just you know a memory I have and I, I I'm not going to base it on that but to me it, it makes sense. the only thing I can imagine where I would have got traumatized to the place that I could take that was I I had already been traumatized does that make sense <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it it does. Um and um and just so you know, Mary Lou, um it looks like it looks like the forces of darkness are trying to black out this uh your call a little bit. We're having a, a little bit of a breakup, which doesn't surprise me because when we've done these kinds of shows in the past, um we know well, we know what we're dealing with. We're uh, yeah. and and fortunately. So there is a little bit of a, a breaking up on your call on your line. So uh, what we might need to do is have you call back in if it continues because we really need to get this information out to people. It's very vital. And um, uh, for those of you who um, uh, may have had difficult hearing uh, Mary Lou, um, in essence, uh, she, you know, of course, you know, she doesn't 
have firsthand evidence. Uh, it's anecdotal. It's circumstantial. But as she pieced this together, uh, and of course, according to research of other people who've been through similar situations because of some ties that may or may not have existed between, um, was it your father, did you say? In the mil- who yeah. was the person in the in the in the uh, in the Air Force that was into the occult? Was that your dad? No, it was uh, my father when he was young, and then was released on a, a medical discharge because he had. Been okay, we're 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 losing you completely here. So, um, I oh gosh, with all the technical difficulties we've had, I'm so sorry. But is there any way, Mary Lou, that we could get you to just go ahead and hang up and call right? back into the show and press sure. one to talk to the host. We might just have a bad voice over IP line uh, that the demons of death have gotten their hands on, but um, could you do that for us real quick? Just go ahead and disconnect and call back in and see if we can get a b- brand new fresh line when you do. Okay, I All sure right. will. All right, praise Jesus. We're going to be looking right for your call. All right, and I'm watching the line, watching the line, watching the line. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so she just dropped, so we're going to watch for that line to come back in. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father, just go ahead and give us a good line. We bind the forces of darkness. We bind the forces of darkness. We plead the blood of Jesus over this. We plead the blood of Jesus in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ over this over this radio, over this call. Father God, in Jesus' name, alleluia, alleluia. Thank you, Jesus, alleluia. All right. So anyway, folks, so what So what she's believing, ultimately, and I might not have the, you know, the relationship with the family and stuff exactly right, but ultimately, it's either you're part of the family, you're, you're actually raised up as a kid uh, in a long history uh, with multiple generations going back all the way to ancient Germany and the, you know, who knows where, uh, and you're part of the actual Illuminati families, e.g. the Blue Bloods and such. Or uh, you're indoctrinated at one point or another through uh, relationships that were established as part of the occult, uh, uh, you know, practices that maybe somebody as part of your generation had been involved with. Okay, and um, and uh, and in those cases, you can have situations whereby the actual children, while they're still in the womb, are uh, are bequeathed to Satan. Uh, so you can have situations where uh, a person, a family, may not actually be part of the Illuminati, uh, but because they were part of the um, of the rituals, uh, they had uh, made some covenants with the devil. Uh, you know, because Satan actually shows up, and we got you. We see you on the line there. We're going to cut over to you real quick here. Satan actually shows up. Okay, in a host body, uh, evidently shows up as a very good-looking man. Uh, you know, uh, at these events. Uh, it's very common at these uh, ritual, especially at sacrificial uh, ceremonies where they're killing somebody. Uh, he likes to show up there, and then they have all kinds of awful, uh, you know, abominable, you know, orgy party type things. It's very disgusting, and that's the tip of the iceberg, folks. I'm not going to say the kinds of stuff that they do routinely, okay, but it's pretty horrible stuff. But when you get involved in that stuff, uh, you know, a lot of these people are afraid to leave those groups because their lives are at stake. They, they're very, they're not shy. They'll come right out and say, hey, you made a blood covenant with us. If you try to break away from our group, we're going to kill you. We're not only going to kill you, we're going to kill your kids. We're going to kill your mom. We're going to kill your uncle. We're going to kill your aunt. We're going to kill your grandmother, and we're going to kill them slow, and you're going to have to watch them it's 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 like the worst possible nightmare you could ever imagine in your wildest horrific dreams from the bowels of hell that is how dark this stuff is so evidently she believes she got linked into this not as a direct bloodline member of the illuminati but by some affiliation or possible covenant maybe that had been made uh through somebody that was part of her family and that is probably the process that was duplicated uh for the other children uh that got um brought into this uh you know, darkness and uh, SRADID activity from the Illuminati at that local military base, a very common practice amidst those um, uh, entities. Praise Jesus. All right, um, Mary Lou, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, Oh, you sound so much better. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. All right. All right. (laughs) So, So tell us about the doors, the unprotected areas exposed by the enemy. What's that all about? Well, I just started um, going down the line of anything I could think of. 
um, that could be an open door to the enemy. Now, before I found out about this witchcraft and all of this stuff, God had already had me um, closing doors. And what I mean by doors is, is where I had had uh, intimate relationships before I married my husband. I, I call those soul ties, and I, I went back and I would cover those and ask forgiveness for that and ask God to break that any tie, ungodly tie I had with anyone. I, I consider that a door. I started, um, once once this started with the witchcraft, I thought, oh, my goodness. So as my, my husband started researching, and he would research, like, all the things that um, they did, in those rituals and and what they did in all those circumstances, then I started taking each thing at a, at a time. Like he went uh, down the list, and we broke any contract that was made over me, any uh, any uh, exchange of anything. I could just go on and on because as he would read things that they did, he said, "Well, let's break this over you. Let's pray this over you to make sure that there's no connection to the enemy left." Because what a, a a weapon for the enemy to have is that you can't remember any of these things that happened to you, and yet he, Satan is able to have those open doors to attack you through them, and you don't even know they're there. And it explains so many things in my life. I think I'm pretty sure when I married my husband, uh, all of the um, all of the things that they had done, the programming and things started breaking down because I started having what is they call in research internal earthquakes. And what would happen is I'd wake up at midnight and I would just start shaking. It's just like everything around me was shaking. And there were a couple of times I went to an emergency room because I thought um, that I was having a heart attack or something because when you just start shaking and you're having all this adrenaline release, you don't know what's going on. But then after, you know, years later when my husband started researching, I thought, oh, my goodness, I was having those internal earthquakes. Um, and, and it was just – it was one of those those things where it's so hard to imagine – that something like that could happen to you. And, and believe it or not, it wasn't just my memories and what I went through personally that convinced me. It was what was going on in the, the town around me. It was bizarre things and just constant things. And I, I remember asking God, I said, God, is there any way that you can prove this to me? And uh, one night I went to, I, after I'd prayed that, I went to, to sleep. I woke up in the in the night and I was trapped inside a star like i was spread eagle inside a star and i i know i walked to my living room i had to but i felt like i floated inside the star and so i got to the living room and i was able to say in jesus name and it broke it and so i went back and i i you know told my husband i said i need you to pray for me something awful just happened and so he prayed for me but i started having one of those internal earthquakes and that's one of the things that that probably happens down in that area where I was raised all the time. They just don't know what's going on because I would look at the clock and it would read one eleven. I'd look at the clock, it'd read two twenty two, and so I found out later those are programming cues that it's it's like they put a timer in your head and and you'll look at the clock and it will be five 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 and and so it was those type things that that my husband had researched and that we were able to put together that convinced both of us yes something horrible did happen to me and not only had it happened to me but it had involved this whole town I was in now I don't know if everybody in that town has had the trauma I had but I can tell you that whole town's being controlled and my husband saw this with me thank God because it sounds so bizarre um, there were lights that were in the sky and they would come in the, in the sky and come in a, a particular pattern, great big, huge lights. And they would flash, and then they'd stop, and they'd repeat the same pattern. Well, I, I saw them three three different times. And the first time I saw them, there were cars everywhere, and I kept thinking, they're going to pull over, and everybody's going to get out of their car and say, what in the world it is? Well, nobody even acted like they could see these lights. And so that, to me, was an indicator. You know, these things are causing some kind of a... A hyp hypnotic trance or something to where it's hazing the people out and i think what happened with me is i prayed and prayed until i got out of that control and i could actually see what was going on oh i believe it absolutely um there's this guy that calls himself the yahweh prophet and he conjures up uh the, the these 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 lights in the sky ufo entities beings creatures whatever you call it. I, they're fallen angels they're fallen angels they're principalities right, right. powers and strongholds in high places high places Absolutely. is up high look up look up they're there there they are <laughs> i mean folks the bible yeah and they left when serious. i commanded them to go in jesus name they would receive amen amen and so uh, go ahead. 
that, that go, go ahead. ahead. I was just telling you that I, I absolutely agree with you. And, and I'll just say this for the listeners. There was not one thing I encountered in all of the crazy things that I saw that the name of Jesus did not stop at all because he does have the name that's above every name. Oh yeah, amen. We had uh uh there's a there's a uh a lady uh who's been a friend of our ministry for many years now and uh her name's Trish. And um she was actually uh uh you know, had an episode of UFO hunters um uh, where they came out with cameras and everything to her house um because uh these demonic orbs would uh congregate in her backyard. She actually has photographs of these things. It's amazing these colorful It is strange orbs that just congregate and she would go out she would just walk out in the backyard and say in the name of Yeshua Jesus get out and they would just flee <laughs> and uh-huh. she could like manipulate and control these little things with uh with the power of Jesus and uh this is amazing um tell tell us so what what it, what's up with the it, you know you have this little section in your book it was subtitled what witches might be doing in some of our churches what's that about oh well, we had a lot of experience with that because what I believe happened was once once they found out I was remembering, once they saw that I was coming out of this, whatever you'd call it, uh, we just had one person after another that would come in, into our church. And, you know, sometimes they they were coming under the guise of they wanted help, and other times they were just coming out of other churches and coming to visit ours and things. Um, and so I was able over the last 20 years to just really um, – monitor what the people were doing and it we weren't using these people by any means anybody that came in we offered them the best help that we had with the limited knowledge we had at the time but but i can tell you that the, that i learned a lot of what what they do and now some of the people that came in it would have been obvious that something was wrong but a whole lot of the people you wouldn't have guessed there was anything wrong with these people because i i think that they were all did and I think that some of these people were from these occult families, these bloodline families like the Illuminati. And I can tell you when those doors would open up, when you know, when, and those back personalities come forward, oh my goodness, it was it was a startling thing to see how that they would just change. And uh, I think what happened is I think the anointing that was on my husband's ministry was just causing these doors to fly open when they didn't want them to come open, and they just their back parts started coming up and talking to us. And um, so I I don't have any doubt that they're in all the churches, that they're manipulating things, and and these people are very talented. A lot of times they'll be the the ones that can sing, quote scripture like nothing you've ever seen. And what I found out is they want to to give you clothes. This is going to sound crazy, but I had so many people giving me clothes, and I finally figured out what it was. It's just like there was an anointing like on the apron, you know, that they'd use to lay on people. Uh, yes. in the New Testament, and they be healed. Well, there's some kind of counterfeit thing that they do with clothes. And I finally caught on to it, and I thought, well, I'm not wearing any more of these clothes. Um, but I think that they do a, like a ritual over those clothes, like to where if you wear them, they affect you. They love to give you presents, and they they give you gifts. They love to feed you, because I can tell you I had <laughs> I, I um, confronted someone that I thought had done something to the food, because we would have church dinners and everybody just you know how they have the church suppers and everybody brings something and so i confronted them and their back personality came up and i said did you do something to that food and they said well the the heat kills the germs like that was just a common thing you know (laughs) and i was so shocked and and so from that point on i didn't let anybody eat food like that if we didn't you know get it catered and brought in or i fixed it and prayed or we just didn't do it because i thought you know, there's no. I, they told me what they put in foods. One of them did, and I just thought, oh, if the churches knew this, they'd never have another <laughs> church supper. Um, but they they really are adept at going in in churches and finding out the weaknesses and just. I I just think that they're they're making a mockery out of any of us that are trying to serve the Lord. There's no question about it. Um, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, uh, and again, you can. There's a, there's always you know in every dark cloud there's a silver lining and and you know and I, I don't want to be too colloquial but um you know uh when it, th- that really is in in some ways a, a bibli- uh, you know a, a, a biblical thing 
Um, you know, Jesus said, are not two sparrows sold, sold for a copper coin and not one of them falls to the ground outside of the Father's will. So, uh, there, you know, so, yeah, are they doing these things? Yeah, absolutely. So before I continue with my little thing about the 5013C church, you know, thing, um, I personally believe that the forces of darkness uh, ultimately uh, were behind the establishment of the 5013C church uh, uh, corporation. Uh, and, and one of the... Uh, there's so many things that is dark about that, and a lot of the people who are in the churches they don't they don't get it they don't see it they're unwitting they're just kind of you know happy go lucky and ignorant and they're unaware that's why we're doing this show um but um you know when you are forced as a church and and uh, and the smart the new churches the new churches that are springing up that are wise uh, to the devil and and their tactics uh they won't do five oh one three c um but the uh-huh. the old the ones that have been around you know they they do and when they in the second that they do they have to establish a board and um one of the things that the uh brotherhood will do is the brotherhood will they will they will get together at their coven meetings and they will assign the people in the covens uh, to various churches, and their uh-huh. job is to go in and get on the board. And they're and just as you said, they're some of the most uh, 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 happy-go-lucky, smiling, uh, loving, uh, huggy, wuggy, kissy, wizzy. They just love the j- hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, and they even speak in tongues. But it's not really tongues it's actually a demonics language and they get on the board of directors and the first things they start doing is getting rid of all the prayer nights so the prayer is going to leave the church right away uh then they're going to you know they, what they do is they rip the church apart but they do it yeah. in a um in a uh, very charismatic fashion to make everybody yeah. on the board think that they're doing it for good reasons and and uh well, it's they- just a horrible thing it is, and I, I and some of the most sickening spirits that I have run into are religious spirits, and that's what these people have. You know, they're very savvy at how they uh, they bring forth what they want, and I, I just think it's, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to write this book is I was so shocked at how little I knew, <laughs> uh, and how much the occult is trained, and it shouldn't be that way. You know, the body of Christ needs to be the ones that, that have that information. We need to know what's going on. We need we need to be um, well-versed in what the enemy does so we can pray accordingly. And I, I was just continually, the last 20 years, I've been so shocked. It's kind of leveled out the last few years to where uh, I'm not shocked every day like I used to be. But it was, it was such a shock to me, um, some of the people that had these back personalities. I, I actually had one of the people that came initially to me and warned me about, a lot of the people in my town, but I just couldn't believe it because all I had ever seen was their front personality in those churches. And I I just thought they cannot be involved in these horrible abominations, surely. But it was the truth. What they told me was the truth. (laughs) And I was so shocked and I thought, oh my goodness, if I could ever tell the churches one thing, it would be, uh, be sure and put some kind of um, system where the children are to where there's a monitoring system, because it wouldn't take these people very long to hurt a child. And that's that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. I thought, now it's, you know, it's one thing what somebody's done to me, and I haven't had trouble forgiving those people. I, I mean, it took me a little while, but I did it. But I have um, such a, uh, a strong stand against what they're doing to the little children, and that's what's why it's got to be stopped. You can't just sit by and act like, okay, I'm not going to look at this when there are little children that are being tormented. Oh yeah, folks, and and again, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, and you know, I, I I just have a feeling that you're probably just because of kindness and the fact that we're on a radio program, you're probably not really being full disclosure. And I'm just here to tell you, folks, the stuff that they do is absolutely horrible. They they will yeah. put uh, charismatic individuals, young young people uh, uh, that are part of their covens, they will put them in and get them to be uh, uh, heads of the uh, youth youth uh, uh, the youth churches and the youth organizations at the church. And then what they'll do is they'll go after some of the teenagers and they'll get them to come over and join their little groups uh, uh, down the road, you know, on Saturday night, wink, wink. Uh, and and uh-huh. folks, I'm, it, 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 so they're in the church recruiting the kids that are in the church to come and join uh, the, the the demonic, uh, you know, stuff that they do over, and that's how they bring in new people into their covens. Okay, mm-hmm. and then um, that's part of it. And then some of the deep, 
darker stuff they do with the littler kids is just so sickening words cannot describe we're talking about abuse uh you know sexual things uh just really really filthy abominable dark things and and folks we're talking about people we're talking about people who indeed what they do is they do things like on a on a particular christian holiday they will go and get in a van and they'll drive down a road and they'll 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 uh uh um uh jump out of their car and they'll go grab a church pastor they'll throw him in the back of the truck they'll take him off to a distant place in the woods they'll nail him upside down to a cross and then they'll start doing horrible things to his body while he's screaming out in pain that's the kind of stuff that these people do this is a very dark they will they will rent churches they will rent churches Churches. They will rent Catholic churches, especially. They're very fond of the Catholic church because they have a lot of, I don't know, satanic stuff that's in the Catholic church. The symbolism and the stuff that they use at the altars uh, is very satanic and ritualistic, and they like those places. And on Saturday nights when the lights are lit, and you, if you're part of that Catholic church, or you, you know that they're not having mass or whatever, mass, I don't even like that term, and that you, can, you can pretty much expect that what's going on behind that lit building is, is not a normal Catholic uh, service. Okay, these these people are well connected. They have military people backing them. They have the resources of a uh, high end law enforcement. We're talking about black ops here, folks. They got all kinds of satellite equipment. Um, people that climb up in trees and with with binoculars, like you see in movies like The Born Identity, uh, looking down the looking down the road two miles off in the distance to see if any cars are coming. They know what they're doing, and 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 the law enforcement. Is is on their side. You can call the cops all you want, and guess what? No one's coming because the people that control the police are going to these meetings. This is some dark stuff, folks. It is very dark. And anyway, so um, anyway, so what? So what else can you tell us? I mean, to warn us about? I mean, what are some of the signs that we can look for? You know, in our churches, for those of us who do belong to churches, what can we, is there anything, a giveaway, a hint that might let us say, hey, man, I, I, maybe I need to go warn the pastor? Well, I know that, that I I have had a gift of discernment my entire life. I didn't know it, and I sure wouldn't have thought that's what it was when I was depressed, because um, one of the, the things that I remember so clear, and, and maybe this will help someone, is that when I was still depressed and my husband and I were attending another church, it was a charismatic church, and uh, there was a a young woman that was very talented that was up in front, and she started um, almost looked like um, an epileptic fit. And I remember the pastor saying, now don't judge her because sometimes people react differently based on what the presence of the Lord does. And I remember my stomach was sinking, the ba- hair on the back of my head was standing up, and I thought, my goodness, if this is God, I'm in such bad shape that I'm sitting here just about to fall over. Well, when all of this happened, that girl just happened to belong to one of these families that was in this attack against us. And so my discernment was working. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times I think if we ask for the gift of discernment, God will give it to us. And we sure need that. Any, in, you know, especially some of the older ladies in the churches, I think sometimes they'll they'll have a clue that maybe somebody's sounding good, but maybe there's something just off a little bit. And one of the things that I, I found out that God just dropped in my spirit one day that helped me more than anything was he told me to um, – I, w- I went into a, a doctor's office to try to help a, a family that was caught in the occult. And when I got there, it was the most chaotic environment I've ever seen in my life. And so uh, I was praying in the Spirit, and I I think I got the interpretation of the prayer God was having. And it was, I asked God to forgive the sins that had been done in that building. The minute that I did that, it was like he let the air out of a balloon. All the occultic power left. It was like the people all left out of the building. It just left. And so I started thinking about that, and I thought, you know, in our churches, if we've got some... some, um, godly people sitting in there, if they just start asking forgiveness for the sins of all the people that are in that place, just ask God to forgive their sins and cover their bloodlines with the blood of Jesus, I am telling you, it will break that occultic power. I cannot believe that you just said that. I cannot believe that you just said that. I have got to share because this is huge. Folks, any of you who have not 
taken the time to listen to the show that we had just recently with Brother Henry Groover. Henry Groover just said exactly the same thing. He had traveled across the world. He was known as the Walker. He'd written some books about how, you know, he, the Lord has taken that, that guy. God bless his soul uh, oh, all wonderful. over the world. Oh, he is wonderful. And get this. He he had had, had, had uh, you know, gangsters and all kinds of, you know, even guys of Hezbollah, members of Hezbollah, uh, pushing him up against the wall, threatening his life, holding guns to his head. And Jesus told him in his heart, said, uh, the Lord actually said to him when his life was immediately, uh, you know, he was going to get killed. And he knew it. And um, the Lord said to say, to pray to him silently. He didn't even have to move his lips. He just said, forgive them, Father for they know not what they do. And boom, the whole problem would be diffused, and all of a sudden they'd pack yeah. up and leave, and he'd be like, what happened? The second yeah, that, it breaks that, that he power. Asked, wow, that's mind-blowing. That and so think, think about, like, I started using that same principle over our government, is I started just going down the list, and I'd say, Father, I ask you to forgive the sins that have been done in the White House. I ask you to forgive the sins that have been done in the Congress, by all the Congress. If all of the Christians would start praying those prayers, I think that we would see big breaking of, of occultic power. And, you know, I never even walk in a store. If I go in a store before I go in there, I say, Father, I ask you to forgive the sins of the corporation, the owner of this store, the people that work there, the sins that have been done in the building, on the grounds, down the center of the earth, up to heaven. I take authority. I bind de- demonic power. And when I walk in there, I do great. If I forget to pray that prayer, I know it. <laughs> and so, but but if we'd all start praying those prayers, I think we would start seeing the power of God move in a in a major way. Are you there? Oh, sorry, Hello? sorry, sorry. It was a mic mute, mic mute, oh. mic mute. Um, I'm oh, sorry okay. about that. Yeah, the. That's uh, okay. uh, I was just saying, I'm I'm real big on that myself. I just uh, uh just put together my first bottle of holy oil. Now I, I've been using holy oil for like forever, uh, but I for, I made I created I actually, uh, you know made my own holy oil instead of buying it from uh-huh. Israel. I bought uh, some uh, oil, some uh, olive oil from, from actually the Holy Land, from Israel. I had to get it, you know, the imported one. And then um, I added my own uh, cinnamon and frankincense and myrrh to it because oh, the ones I that, that I was... Good. Oh, it does. And and the ones that I because the ones I was buying from uh, Israel, they were just quite there. You know, they they were kind of good, but not. And I wanted something that smelled really, really good. So um, yeah, I got a whole big old uh, 750 milliliter bottle of this stuff, and I take it very seriously. Praise Jesus. And and I think that's a wonderful uh, bit of advice that you. I I cannot recommend, folks, to, for those of you listening on podcast. Rewind it and listen to what Mary Lou said because, folks, okay, for example, th- this is not just Mary Lou. This is me telling you, and it's also probably hundreds, if not thousands, of people who are uh, full of the Holy Spirit and understand spiritual warfare. These are things that you do as part of your daily walk, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and it shouldn't, be, for example, in the book, Gazing in the Glory by Bruce Allen. He tells in the beginning of the book how he was on a uh, missions trip over in, uh, I think it was Fiji, and he was in this hotel. And he had, um, I don't know, I guess he traveled with a particular pillow that he liked. And, of course, he used holy oil and pled the blood of Jesus over everything that he has and his property, which we should all do. We should all consecrate all of our property to the full ownership of Jesus Christ. You need to treat these things like bugs. They, if you just think of them as cockroaches, think of them like cockroaches. What do you do with, with, with bugs? When you have cockroaches, uh, cockroaches are the best ones to use because everybody's freaked out by them and they're so pervasive. All right, what do you do? You get yourself some good ortho home defense and you walk around the perimeter of your house and you squirt it all around your house and you build a force field. All right, now, now you're like, okay, well, where's that in the Bible? All right, I'll give you a little hint. There's more than this. I'm just going to give you a, a one little itty bitty hint. Zechariah 2 5. For I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be in the, the glory in her midst. He's talking about the protection of Jerusalem. All right, but anyway, you want to do these things in advance. When, 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 when Bruce Allen was in Fiji, he forgot his pillow. And the first night he was in the hotel, he was having these horrible nightmares, which never happened to him. Never. And he was like, 
oh, it, it hit him. He was like, oh, I get it. He was actually experiencing the demonic buffeting that was a result of other people, soul ties, uh, that had been in the bed. Okay, and so what he did, and of course soul ties have to do with sexual intercourse, but that's a whole other thing. But anyway, the point is that he, you know, there's a connection there, and uh, an energy. It's like an aura, and it's like they leave. It's like a gooey substance from the de- the, the dark side, and it's on the bed, and you want to get rid of it. So you get your holy oil, and you go around the perimeter of the bed in the name of Jesus. I consecrate in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ all over this bed. I come, I, I, you know, you commit it. You give it full ownership. To Jesus Christ, and you and you go around the perimeter of the bed, and you protect it, and he did that, and boom, all his problems were over, and he was sleeping like a baby. So, folks, I don't know, you know, if I were you, I would rewind and listen to what she just said, because that is a practice we all need to put into to full force nowadays, because, I mean, I think we're pretty much in the very, very last days, and we're going to need to know these things more than ever more than ever and put them into practice more than ever which segues into my question in your book you had this section called you know last days indicators what what's that all about well i um i think that there are so many things that are happening right now um that show us that we're in, in the last days and um you know in in all this process of this last 20 years where i've had to process everything what became really clear to me was that there's there's technology that has been developed that is being used in conjunction with the demonic. So sometimes, we, of course, we have authority over the demonic, and we can bind that in Jesus' name. But I've we've had to um, kind of establish some prayers to just uh, ask God to put shields up because there there are different attacks that can come, especially the people that have been uh, traumatized in the Monarch Project and especially in some of the the military bases where they were trying to create um, super soldiers. Um, they, they, I believe that there are people that can cause aneurysms that are super soldiers. I believe that there are people that can um, do all kinds of things. So, you know, when there's when there are things like that, there's a demonic element, of course, but I think that there's also things like, I think that they project things all the time through the cell phone towers. I think that there are things that come through the the television frequencies, the flashing of the light that's at a subliminal message, you know, or level. I mean, and so I think that it's some of the things that we have to watch out for is that specific, those specific things, and pray accordingly. Because I, every day I ask God to put impenetrable shields above me, beneath me, all the way around that nothing can get through, and those type of prayers will handle the technological side of this while we still do our spiritual warfare. Oh yeah, amen. Every, you know anybody who's <laughs> anybody who's ever joined us on our Friday night prayer vigils uh, uh, knows that I'm real. That's it's really, really. I, I I think that arguably one of the most important parts of our prayer, uh, uh, the cycle of prayers that we bring. You know, when, especially when we're doing spiritual warfare. Um, you know, we have to bind the strong man. Uh, uh, then we can plunder his house. Well, what is the strong man's house? Our body, our host body. That's where the strong man controls the demons of death that are you know bind you know that are that are you know inside of us. And then, uh, when, then, then, you know, once we bind and take out the strong man, we can, uh, you know, uh, come after the unclean spirits, kick them out of the house, uh, you know. But then, uh, as Jesus warned us, uh, then seven more, uh, more dastardly spirits will come back and dwell in that house. So the first thing I do after I bind and cast out the demons uh, from the people, uh, the unclean spirits uh, from the lost. Uh, the very first thing I do is I ask the Father to surround them with a with a holy fire, with a hedge of protection, uh, and to, to keep their eyes open, to keep their ears open, that they will be able to see what they, they will be able to hear. Uh, you know, because you know, because you want to keep that clean swept house full of the Spirit of God, so that they're able to hear uh, what the and and, uh, and you know, because the Lord uses us. I mean, whether it be a divine healing. Uh, you know, if you look at a div- you know person who was given a gift of divine healing or d- the gift of miracles from First Corinthians chapter twelve, if you look at that individual operate in the gifts of the Spirit, um, and they, you know they're like, in the name of Jesus, I bind and cast out. In the name of Jesus, I command you to be healed. Stand up, accept the healing in the name of Jesus. And and when that happens, you know, a lot of people are like, wow, he healed them. No, he didn't. The power of Jesus moved through that person's body as a conduit. We are Mm -hmm. conduits of the power of heaven. We unleash 
the the angels. We unleash the power of the, the, the heavenly throne room of God, and we are that conduit, just like the witches from the bowels of hell are for the forces of darkness. They're the conduits for the darkness, and we're the conduits for the true light for all good gifts and all perfect gifts come from above and come down from the father of lights glory to jesus hallelujah first uh, james james 1 verse 17 so that's what we do we do the opposite of what they do but we do it with the power of god and that changes everything but yes we have a mission i mean that's our mission isn't that i mean wouldn't you say that you know People need to really kind of embrace these things as opportunities and get involved, even if they're in a wheelchair or housebound or a shut-in. I mean, don't we all need to spend some time, you know, uh, in an intercessory prayer coming against these forces? Oh, I absolutely think so. And as a matter of fact, uh, I'm so glad you mentioned Henry Groover because I was fortunate enough to get some tapes of his um, – several years back, and I I tell you, it, it showed me one thing uh, that I, I thought I knew anyway, but I think he convinced me is the greatest power there is, is the love of God. And if we can have that love flow through us, I think we can, the power is unlimited. Um, and, I, and you have to think about this too, like, you know, someone like Henry Groover, what a, a seasoned man of God that has walked so many years and clearly hears the, the voice of God. And I can tell you all the years until I came out of that depression, I maybe heard the voice of God one time, and I think that was just because God had to get it through my head that I was supposed to marry my husband, and I heard him that time. But other than that, I I couldn't hear the voice of God. And think about this. Think about how few people probably clearly hear God's voice and get his direction. In contrast to these witches that sit with demons at the foot of their bed, giving them step-by-step instruction. And so, you know, that was that is was my clue that I better really get in and have that prayer closet time and seek God with all my heart, you know, close any door that I that I had. And one prayer that that I probably would be helpful to some people, um, you know, because I, I've said this to a lot of the Freemason descendants, uh, you know, I think that Satan just torments those families through that tie. And and sometimes people don't know that Freemasonry is is an open door to the enemy. And and so one of the prayers that God gave me originally, before I knew I had all these doors open, he said, ask me to put the blood of Jesus over the doors in your life. And so that prayer gave me that, that buffer zone to where I, I could learn what those doors were and close them while not, you know, giving Satan the entryway to just beat my head in. Because I think those the witches had been cursing my family ever since I married my husband. And and we were sick all the time. There was one thing after another happening. And and once I prayed that prayer, things started going the other way. Wow, that's awesome! Praise Jesus. So, uh, for those out there, I'm I'm an applied Christianity 101 guy. So let's you know how would you g- give us an example of you know how you would recommend someone prays uh, to close portals to break soul ties you know what would how how would you recommend that i mean you know to 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 people to pray to get rid of these soul ties and to close down these portals well if they have a a a soul tie which would be um any kind of you know sexual activity they've done before they got married that would be considered an ungodly soul tie and what i did in my situation is i wrote the names down and i specifically went through the list and i said father please forgive me for this I asked you to sever the soul tie between me and this other person. I asked you to deliver me of anything that came through that soul tie to me, and I asked you to deliver that other person from anything that came from me. And that was how I broke my soul ties. And then I just started going you know, down the list. I had found out, um, I'll mention this because it was so significant, and, and this might help some people too, if there's there were organizations that I had belonged to just as a kid and different things, and and uh, you sign pledges and you make pledges and things in these organizations. If those organizations have a foundation in Freemasonry, that is a door that Satan can use against you. You'd think, how could Satan possibly do something like that? A little kid just – but any written contract, if you sign a pledge card, if you if you do these different things, he and, and that, that established uh, organization had the foundation by Freemasons, which is a whole bunch of them if people want to look at it, that's a, that's a door. 
And so what I did on those things is I just asked God to cover any pledges that I made. I asked him to break any uh, ties that were made through me signing my name on a signature card or through any organization. I I commanded Satan to, to leave me through those doors, and I'd plead the blood and ask God to seal those doors shut. And that's that's pretty much how I came out. And God was just showing me one thing after another, you know, of the of the different ways that Satan can sneak in. Because, you know, since we're Christians, if something came at us and, and it looked horrible, obviously we're going to reject it. So he's always going to sugarcoat something. Uh, it's like he does with Halloween. Yeah, and I, I've told this before. I don't think I gave the specific uh, situation in my book, but there was a – I always have people that I know now call me if they hear of a little child that's uh, like bobbing for apples at Halloween or anything like that because the bobbing for apples specifically is a dangerous thing uh, because that came from a druidic practice where uh, they were going to give people the choice of bobbing for an apple in boiling cider where their face would have been deformed if they survived it, or they could go in the wicker man and be burned up. So even though that's an innocent thing that a child would just be playing a game at Halloween and bob for an apple, what he does is he goes after their face then. And so I had someone call me and said that there was a little child that had been bobbing for apples, so they wanted me to pray. So I wrote it on my prayer list, and I hadn't got to the prayer yet. I got another call later that day before I got to to pray. I've learned now to just pray right then and not put it off. And what had happened is that little child was involved in a wreck, and it uh, damaged their face, and they thought they were going to have to do plastic surgery. And see, that's how Satan works. He takes those things that we would think, well, there's nothing to that, and he uses them because their their origin is something pagan. And so I was able to ask God to forgive the sin of that whole thing, cover that with the blood of Jesus, bring restoration, and that little child didn't have to have plastic surgery. Wow. Wow, that's powerful. So um, so would you go ahead and take uh, some time to help people understand where they can go to get more information? Um, uh, tell them where they can, you know, any information you might have, a website, um, a, you know, the name of your book again. Because um, I, know, I, I know from past experience that uh, there's a lot of people uh, that, you know, hear these things and they're, you know, a light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, no, you know, I need uh, to reach out. I need more information. Where where can people go to find out more stuff about this? Oh, sure. They can, um, if they'd like to go to our website, it's at www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. And if they click on the Mind Control tab at the top, you can find information about my book there, which is what witches don't want Christians to know. Now, if they go and try to purchase my book on Amazon, they need to make sure that they uh, purchase the expanded edition. I think they have a couple left of the the original one before I put that expanded edition on the back. So they need to make sure they're getting the expanded edition with the picture of the woman and the butterfly on the front. And then if they would like to email me, uh, they could email me at nomindcon, all together, at outlook.com. Oh, wow. Praise Jesus. That's awesome. Um, and uh, if you would, uh, we would love it if you would, t- if you would, if you would close the show tonight uh, uh, with a prayer. Oh, I, I'd be honored to. Praise God. Okay. Well, Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus. And, Father, I know that there are people that are listening, Father, that maybe haven't known uh, the extent of what's going on all around us. But, Father, you can give us courage so that we can look at these things. It's hard to look at it, Father, but you can give us the courage. And I just ask that you loose that courage right now to every listener, to every person that needs to be able to to see these things so that they can actually combat the enemy like you told us to do in Ephesians 6. And, Father, I just ask that you would um, send the anointing, Father, to free people from bondage. Send the anointing, Father. To every person, you know what every person needs. Father, if there's someone that's listening that may be in the occult and maybe they're listening just to see what's being said, Father, let them know that, that you love them. Let them know that there's a way out of anything. And Father God, you've, you've made a living proof by me that even though the highest levels of the occult have come after our family, Father, we're still here and all because of you. And, Lord, you can do miracles, and you can do anything. Father, if people will just fall into your arms and just say, Father, show me what to do, then they can come out of anything, and they can have the joy and the peace that maybe they've not been able to experience before. And so, Father, I just ask that you lead each one of us, 
that you would show us more truth, just show us more every day what we need to learn to face these end days. And, Father, we give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Uh, and and um, uh, real quick, Mary Lou, uh, we're, we're getting some word back from the chat room that uh, people were having a hard time uh, copying your website again. Could you share that oh, with us one more time? I, sh- I sure will. And the, it's all all together. There's no breaks in this after the www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Okay, and Kingdom the, Intelligence, uh, so I'll just repeat it, Kingdom Intelligence Briefing dot com. Kingdom Intelligence yeah. Briefing dot com. Praise God. And what was the That's email it. again? The email is no mind con. Short for no mind control. No mind con altogether with no breaks at Outlook dot com. All right. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we stand in agreement. We stand in agreement with that prayer. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that people will become doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, deceiving themselves. James one twenty two. Folks, we all want to be profitable servants, profitable servants in the kingdom of God, profitable servants. Pro- folks, get out there. Send emails. Send links. Let people know what's going on. We need to get the word out so that if, if the one thing that they can walk away with more than anything, even if they have a hard time understanding how pervasive this problem is with the Brotherhood of Satan and these witch covens and stuff that are in virtually every town in the United States and, and, and abroad. It's all over Europe. It's, it's all over Africa. It just comes in different forms. And folks, we need to let people know what we're up against and how to stand against it with the power of Jesus and with the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. What a blessing. Thank you so much, Sister Mary Lou, for joining us tonight. God bless you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was it was a pleasure. All right. God bless you and take care. Uh, everybody will see you. Uh, gosh, I can't even remember what day it is. All right.